Welcome to Behavioral Groups, the podcast that explores human behavior through a behavioral science lens. I'm Kurt. And I'm Tim. We like to explore why we do what we do with researchers, authors, and practitioners in a conversational setting in order to bring those insights to you. We feel like we are adding to the collective knowledge of the world. Uh, but Kurt, maybe we should think about subtracting. Subtracting? I'm, I'm not sure I understand, Tim. I know we, I mean, you and me, are not always the brightest bulbs on the tree, and people may <laughs> want to subtract no. us from this podcast, but our guests are brilliant, so why wouldn't we want to add their knowledge to the world? I'm not saying that we shouldn't add to the knowledge, but after our conversation with Lighty Klotz, I think that maybe we should consider some subtraction. Okay. You're going to have to help me understand. All right. So our guest, Lighty Klotz, is the Copenhaver Associate Professor at the University of Virginia, and his research is filling in some unexplored overlaps between engineering and behavioral science in pursuit of a more sustainably built environmental system. But more importantly to this idea, he studies subtraction. Like math? No, no, like, like how and why we remove things from our lives or more likely don't remove things from our lives, right? Because he has this new book called Subtract, the untapped science of less. And he opened my eyes to the fact that sometimes we just want to keep adding things and that isn't always the best solution. I get it. And yes, the ideas that Lighty talked about should make us think about how we go about our lives adding more and more and more without ever removing things. And that could also apply to adding more knowledge to the world. But, and correct me if I'm wrong here, Tim, he did say that adding isn't always bad and that we need to do both, right? Oh yeah, definitely. Adding isn't bad in itself. It's just that it overshadows subtracting so much that it's pretty much the only thing that we do. And with knowledge, I think it is important that we add these ideas to the world's knowledge bank. I agree. And while I know that the idea of subtraction isn't new, it is one that we should all be thinking about. And this interview definitely gives us some ideas to ponder. Yes, it does. Also, we were lucky enough to have a special guest as part of the show, Lighty's son, Ezra, who is six and who was talked about a lot in uh, Lighty's book, was able to help us out with the speed round. Yeah, Ezra was fantastic. We so appreciated his input and his willingness to participate. So thank you to Ezra and listen for his voice. Yeah. So with that, we invite you to sit back, take a tiny, tiny sip of your subtraction brew, or or maybe even just not have a brew at all, subtract Ooh. it from your life. But wow. don't subtract this conversation with Lighty Klotz. Ezra, how are you? Good. Good. All right. Maybe, hey. maybe let's just, let's just start with a question for Ezra. We have a question yeah. for you. If you had your choice between playing with Legos or wildlife bingo, which would you pick? Legos. Legos? You would pick Legos? Oh, fantastic. Well, thank you. That that was the question that, that we were wondering about. We were wondering if you liked Legos better than the other toys that you played with. Is, are Legos your favorite? I just finished a uh, Harry Potter Lego set. <gasps> oh, was it was it Hogwarts or was it... Uh, Hogwarts. Yeah? It's my first. That's awesome. Are Legos fun to play with because you get to put things together? Or because you get to tear I'm it apart. I'm kind of like a builder. I like building. You like building. Awesome. That is That's fantastic. Good. You were born into the right family for that. <laughs> <laughs> that is- <laughs> Welcome, Lighty Klotz, to Behavioral Grooves. Thanks, Tim. It's great to be here. We are glad to have you here. And we're going to get started with a speed round right away because we can't wait to find out if you prefer coffee or tea. Oh, coffee. It's oh. stronger. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. All right. So would you rather have dinner with your favorite sports star or your favorite musician? Dinner. Um, Didn't think this would be a stumper. Yeah. I, I think like 
probably sports sports star, I guess. Who would, I like, who would that be? Oh, like Michael Jordan. Oh, yeah. yeah. I think I'd, yeah. I would. All right. If you had to, if you had to have a dinner with a sports star and a musician and uh, one dinner, who would those? So you have Michael sitting on one side of the table, and then who is the other guy or person? Bruce, Bruce Springsteen on the other. Bruce side. Springsteen. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Excellent. Excellent answer. Oh, Tim oh. might have something to say about picking Michael Jordan over Bruce Springsteen, and at the at the end <laughs> I, of this, I'm just letting you know that you might get a little grief over over picking Michael Jordan. I, on the other hand. I, on the other hand, fully understand. (laughs) My heart's just a little bit hurt on that one. But, okay, would you prefer spending a day on the beach in the Caribbean or exploring an ancient Mayan city of Koba? Oh, uh, Koba. Uh, In in fact, I've (laughs) explored the ancient Mayan city of Koba, as you know from reading the book. Yeah, (laughs) You're just testing if I actually wrote it, right? (laughs) (laughs) Or or read it, you know. Yeah. There, there's a wonderful story for for our listeners in the book about uh, Lighty's kind of infatuation with with ruins and, and yeah. buildings and large kind of things, and and uh, the choice of doing that as opposed to spending a day on the beach on his honeymoon. So um, we'll, <laughs> the, we'll, the we'll, we'll let you read that uh, for, on your own. But uh, there you go. All right, last speed round question. Obviously, our speed rounds are never really truly speed rounds because we take way too much time with them, but would you recommend using a no bell or a stop doing list to help people subtract things from their lives? Yeah. So the stop doing list, definitely. The no bell is just, you're, you're, you're not adding any, you're slowing your rate of adding. So um, a stop (laughs) doing list, you're actually taking things away. All right. Fantastic. Excellent. So so you are the author of the book, Subtract, The Untapped Science of Less. And so tell us about how the, uh, t- tell us about the book. Give us, a, give us a quick synopsis, if you would. Yeah. I mean, I'm a engineer and designer by training um, and who's become really interested in behavioral science. And um, one of the things that I've noticed um throughout my career is just this kind of difficulty we have taking things away or these kind of untapped opportunities that come from taking things away, whether it's, you know, removing a building to make a pocket park in a city or whether it's removing something from your to-do list to make your schedule more fun or, you know, more productive. The book, I mean, kind of comes out of that line of thinking. uh, And then really the, it builds on a paper that we just, um, is will be published in April in Nature, showing that as humans we just systematically overlook um, subtraction as a way to make things better. So, um, I mean, we will, I'm sure we'll get more into this later in the interview. But the basic issue is that we're doing these mental searches for solutions, and our mind goes to additive solutions before it goes to subtractive ones. So, there is that there's like this kind of basic reason um, or one basic reason why we're overlooking subtraction as a way to make things better. And so the book builds on that finding. I mean, that finding is chapter one of the book. And then the book talks about some of the reasons that this is the case. Um, so whether it's biological reasons or cultural reasons, you mentioned the the desire to build these large ruins. Those are actually pretty core to our all of our history as humans, whether or not you like to go away from the beach when you're on vacation, you're they're they're in your, they're in your lineage. Um, And, and then also economic forces that are kind of pulling us away from, from less too. So there's, there are certainly times where we think to subtract, but we don't do it because, you know, something else is keeping us from that. And then it talks about have then knowing that, how do we, how do we use it to, to take away? And I think, um, you know, this is a, a lofty comparison, <laughs> literally, and I don't think it's, you know, at this level of scientific finding, but, you know, the there, there certainly haven't been any shortage of people who have talked about the need to subtract, right? I mean, Marie mm. Kondo, maybe the most famous <laughs> recently, um, yeah. Yeah. you know, but digital minimalism, um, Tim Ferriss, the four hour work week, uh, all of these are kind of subtractive recommendations and it goes all the way back. I mean, Da Vinci, defining perfection is when nothing's left to take away or even Lao. my favorite is Lao Tzu even farther back talking about, you know, to gain wisdom, you have to subtract something every day. Um, so, so basically this, this, this 
phenomenon has been recognized, but nobody's really understood what the core issue is or that there is like a core thinking issue to this. And by, so therefore by like explaining the science, um, you know, and back to the gravity analogy, it's like you couldn't fly, humans couldn't fly until we understood gravity, right? You could like mm -hmm. throw stuff up in the air and it might stay up in the air for a little while, or you could launch stuff off cliffs and it would do better than just sitting on the ground. But you know, to you have to understand these fundamental forces that you're working against in order to to do better. And so, you know, that's my hope for the book is that it, it uncovers these things that are kind of keeping us from subtraction. And in doing so, it shows people new opportunities to take away in their own lives in ways that, you know, I can think of and outline in the book, but also in ways that, you know, only they can think of. So let's go those fundamental forces. So, so is are our brains hardwired uh, to overlook subtraction? It, it, you said that's kind of the first chapter. So are they hardwired to do this? Is this something that is just innate within our DNA? Um, <laughs> well, we're not sure about innate within the DNA. I mean, I think okay. I would... If this wasn't a behavioral science podcast, I might be like, yeah, yeah, it's, it's, it's hardwired. I mean, what, what people mean colloquially by hardwired, yes. Yes. But uh, yeah. I think, you know, as you're probably referring to it, is it like definitely a biological thing that we have to behave in this way? We're, you know, we're not, we're not sure. I mean, what the, the core finding is that people systematically overlook these subtractive changes. And so um, whether that's, for a biological reason or a cultural reason or like economic reasons that have been reinforced over time with, with behavior. Um, you know, it's, it's certainly some combination of all of those things put together. The, but the bottom line is as people are trying to change things from how they are to how they want them to be, we systematically think of adding first and then only subsequently or with effort or with, you know, reminders, think of subtraction. So in that way, it is, it is hardwired. It's not something that's, um, I mean, we're, we're doing it. If we're le left to our own devices, we will do it. How about that? <laughs> that's good. I, I love, I love how you talk about you, you, you coin it morality. Yeah. <laughs> I, I love that terminology, this morality, but what got you first interested in the idea of subtraction? Probably the morality part. So like, and I, I might have to give credit to a, an editor there for, um, and there were a lot of different things I was calling. No that. way. No way. Yeah. You're going to give credit to the editor on this one? Oh. <laughs> well, I, I don't know. It's, it's, um, they, there was some good input in that chapter, but, um, the, so, so morality is what I use to refer to kind of this most recent force that's kind of pushing us towards more, which is the, you know, this, dogma of economic growth, which again, I don't want to act like that's a bad thing. I mean, I think all else being equal, things have gotten better since World War II. And we said that, you know, it's economy should grow. And that was that's the best way to lift living standards for people. Um, but there's there's also no doubt that that kind of more is better attitude has seeped into all of our thinking in a, in a way that, you know, maybe helps contribute to us overlooking times when less is better. <laughs> so yeah, that's the, that's the piece of morality. And I think, you know, Tim, you asked what got me interested in it. And I think that was my first lens on it. I'm, I've always been, you know, the, I, the issues that brought me to this, you know, the real world issues that brought me to this, like intellectual curiosity have, have been like climate change and environmental issues. And certainly mm. that um, kind of, there's this tension there between um, infinite growth on a finite planet. <laughs> and so, um, and I think that a lot of that comes from that kind of economic um, morality. You start the book with a great story of your, you working with your son, making a Lego bridge and you each making parts of it. Uh, and then that kind of spurred to do some research. And actually, I love this research experiment that that you 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 came up with from this. So, could you first off, a just tell our listeners a little bit about what that encounter with your son and making this Lego bridge, and then how that turned into research? Yeah, um, and it, it's it's crazy to. Th I'm so glad that I was able to document it in a book because it's you know it allows me to reflect back on how it happened and think about how the ideas evolved. And so um, 
you know, to Tim's question, I'd always been interested in this, you know, why don't we do less more often? Um, but never had a way to study it. And so I was playing with my then two year old Ezra with Legos and we were basic the we were basically building a bridge and we had the two columns built, the support columns, um, and went to put the flat part across the top and it wasn't level because the turned out the support columns were different heights. And so I turned around behind me to get another block to add to the shorter column. And by the time I had turned around, Ezra had taken a block off the longer column um, and made the level bridge. And so that helped me kind of hone in on subtraction as the uh, as the issue. You know, it wasn't so much about like the end state of less. It was much more about this, like, why didn't I think of that act of taking away? Why was my first instinct adding? Um, and, you know, since we've done the subsequent studies, it's really interesting how closely that maps to what we found in studies that had nothing to do with Legos. Um, the other nice thing about that Lego study was, you know, I've always, you know, worked with behavioral scientists and, um, but the Lego study finally gave me a way to explain this idea in, in a way that they were like, oh, now I see what you're saying, you know? And so I like, took, <laughs> took, I, I, as soon as like Ezra made the bridge, I'd been carrying it everywhere with me and I was trying it out on, you know, students would come to meet with me and ask questions about class. And I'd be like, well, first do this Lego thing and see what happens. <laughs> Everybody was of course doing the same thing as I did. Um, and then I took it to Gabe Adams, who's a friend and a, a psychology professor. Um, and I'd been talking to her about like, how do I, how do we do research on this idea of less? And I thought she'd figure it out because she's super smart. And because I'd been talking about what I thought was the <laughs> same idea to her, but sure enough, she did the same thing and added. And then I said, no, like, this is what Ezra did. This is what I'm talking about. And she's like, oh, that's, so you're really wondering why we don't subtract to make things better. And I was like, yes, haven't I been saying that? But, um, so yeah, the Legos were really instrumental in getting things started. And, and then from there, I mean, we, we've done all kinds of studies, not just with Legos. Yeah. I love how you have just been willing to explore this through a child's eye, which I'm so glad that we, we brought and then you were generous enough to bring Ezra into the beginning of our conversation here, because uh, it seems like our uh, we've we've had these conversations about being rational and irrational with lots of lots of people over the past you know, several years, and the evolutionary psychologists are like it's not so much about rational or irrational. Like our our, our general DNA kind of works things out, you know, but for a, for a different world than what than what we live in, you know, our world today is more complex. And, and it seems like, I mean, could Ezra just be solving a problem for a simpler world that, that he's just looking at it sort of without the complications that we take on as adults, because as you said, virtually everybody, students, you know, everyone in, in their adult life solves the Lego bridge problem the same way by adding. Yeah. I mean, I should add a caveat here that Ezra over time has proven to be horrible at subtraction. So, um, you know, he, he, I think the, he came up with that, um, that just out of sheer repetition. Um, and this was like the one case where he stumbled on taking away. Uh, but I do, I mean, I think that we're right now we're thinking about what are the next directions to take this research. And I think Tim, that's one of the directions we're thinking of going is like, because if you studied this with kids, you'd be able to isolate, okay, what's the, what's the role of cult like kind of culture slash education slash, you know, exposure to the world here. Right, and right. so, yeah, I think there's a chance that kids might be better at it. At the same time, there are some, you know, biological forces that would be in us no matter our age, uh, like just the desire to acquire, to, mm -hmm. you know, pass on your genes. So, you know, you see pack rats hoarding nuts, even though they're, once they're, you know, instinctively hoarding nuts, once their stash gets stolen, right? They're not deliberately thinking about that. That's an instinct. And then also the, I think um, with the Legos and especially Ezra with the Legos, this innate desire to display competence too, right? Mm -hmm. This you know, show, like the same reason that bower birds build nests, it's not to provide shelter. It's just to show that they're a good candidate for genes, right? And so it's like maybe Ezra's Lego building is just the same as as building nests. And it's harder to it's harder to display competence when you take something away. Um, but again, that's that's all kind of the really interesting fodder for future study. And I do think that cool. as you mentioned, Tim, I'm sure there's a cultural dimension that 
you know, I would love to tease out. What, what do you think are some of the things that get in the way of us to identify when we should be subtracting? And you don't, in, in, in your book, I want to clarify this. In your book, you're not saying that adding isn't, uh, is always bad, that sometimes adding is, is, is positive, but there are other times when you should be looking at subtracting and sometimes when you need both of those aspects to go into this. But there are some elements where we, we don't tend to look for subtraction and what are what are some ways that we might better be able to identify when we should be looking for something to subtract or to take away yeah uh great point i'm so glad you brought up the adding isn't bad thing and you know i think that because that gets right at that same mindset you know the the root of that mindset is that you know if if x then what not y basically mm-hmm. right and it's like you're trying to resolve this contradiction between less and more between adding and subtracting and and they're not in conflict they're complementary ways to change things for the better right they're like two tools that we have in our arsenal or whatever i mean so um and i think if we can break down that that mindset that it's not add or subtract it's add and subtract um that is probably the biggest thing that we could do because then if you're thinking about this thought process right and it's what we found in our research right is that adding is the first thing that comes to mind and that wouldn't be a problem if then adding brought to mind subtracting right Mm. (laughs) yeah it is a problem if it's like you think of adding and then all of a sudden because you've thought of adding you think it can't be subtracting um so you know changing that mindset of these things having to be in conflict and you know that goes back to that cultural question a little bit too because i mean that's a uh i mean obviously there's granularity here that i'm not going to be able to capture in the time we have but like that's like western kind of um individual thinking is more trying to kind of resolve conflict between opposing things whereas you know kind of the eastern interdependent way of thinking is looking at things more as like a balanced complement um maybe the that culture would be better at not necessarily um favoring one over the other so i know that you know think add and subtract is a that's the key takeaway um is that's the that would be a huge step forward and that's one thing that i hope our book hope my book can help people do i was surprised by when I read the book, uh, even with the cues that came from, uh, we got introduced to you because of Allison and Channing Jang and very pro-social people, right? And and when uh, when we when I got the book, I was expecting, oh, this is going to be like a really cool self-help book. This is going to mm-hmm. be like you know, this is going to be like Marie Kondo with fantastic research behind it, you know, right? That is not like what I came away with was you care so much about the environment. You care so much about, uh, about, I mean, you're, you lionize Kate Orff, you know, in her Lexington project in such a wonderful way that I, that I was really inspired by the, the pro social, uh, narrative that, that sort of is the underbelly of the book. And I just think that that's fantastic. So first of all, thank you for, for, for doing that. Um, and, and was that always a part of sort of what you wanted to write? Did you, you know, so you come to this through through the Legos and the bridge, but, and, and you have an engineering background, so I kind of get it, but did you always see an environmental spin on the story? Yeah. Um, and I think, you know, part of it is like finding the right packaging. Um, and, you know, for, so for me, I always, I came to it through this, environmental question of resolving this tension between limits and growth because i mm-hmm. you know as a as an engineer i you know and as just a person who's interested in changing things for the better basically i i believe that you know we want to continue making progress and at the same time it's just you know it's so obvious when we're exceeding planetary tipping points everything from climate change to you know uh, water resources and and things like that so that is what brought me to the question and one of the nice things about the whole process i think you know when you think about as an academic writing a book you're worried that they're going to be like well no you have to write it like marie kondo which her books are great but i that's not the angle that i want to take on it and um they totally encouraged me to have those pro-social things and to play those up even more um and so that that part of it has been a a pleasant surprise um and i yeah i'm glad you I'm glad you liked it, Tim, um, because I think uh, for me, um, 
you know, I do want the book to help as many people as possible, but that might be because one person reads it. Not, you know, I want more than one person to read it, but if one person, <laughs> you've got two, you got two yeah, right yeah, here. Two, yeah. <laughs> if one person reads it, I know yeah, there's been way more than one who've read it already, but uh, if one person reads it and helps a thousand people, I mean, that's as good as a thousand kind of people reading it just for their own, uh, yeah. their own self-help. Yeah. I think it's fantastic. And you reference one of my favorite uh, researchers in this, which is Kurt Lewin. And you bring oh, okay. in, yeah. <laughs> you, bring in um, you know, the, his, his field analysis and various different pieces of this. So as you're thinking through that, the Kurt's uh, force field analysis features for change and against change, uh, and you talk about the subtractive wisdom, you know, how, how does, how does that play into the overall idea of subtraction and how does that impact us as we're thinking through this? Yeah. Well, I just gave a compliment to the book people and like making me make the book smarter, but I wanted to have all these inside jokes in there about Kurt Lewin and they're like, nobody knows who Kurt Lewin <laughs> is. Oh, and I like, oh, oh, we we so, can go back to him and say, Hey, that's not hey, true. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, so Kurt Lewin, I mean, his base, like um, the, the insight that's particularly relevant to subtraction and one of his most famous insights, right. Is that to change behavior, there are two basic options, right? You can um, add forces that are kind of working in the direction that you want to go in, or you can remove barriers to the behavior that you want. And the latter one is the, is the counterintuitive one. And that's what Lewin was pointing out. He's like, you know, we, we often don't think that we can subtract these barriers. Um, so number one, that's like evidence of the same phenomenon that you know we're pointing out in the book. But number two, like in what Kurt Lewin said and what is right is that that's the better way to make change in the cases that he was talking about. And so if you just, just imagine from a, a system standpoint, um, well, in Lewin's words, it's like if you, if you remove the barriers, you're also removing tension from the system, right? Mm -hmm. So if you if you remove a restraining force, you're removing some of the tension from the system, which is going to make it work better. Whereas if you add an incentive, that'll still work, but the barrier is still there, and it's actually increasing the the tension because now you've got all this extra force trying to overcome the barrier rather than getting rid of the barrier. And you know, to put that in terms that people might encounter in their day-to-day -day life. Um, you know, so my son, Ezra, the, if you're trying to, if the desired behavior for Ezra is to have him not watch his iPad after dinner, you can, I can add an incentive. I can say, Ezra, you want, if you, if you don't watch your iPad after dinner, you can have a cookie and that might work. Um, it does increase his desire not to watch his iPad after dinner, but if it doesn't work, he's going to be like, he's going to be pissed off because he's not watching the iPad and he's mad because he didn't get a cookie. Right. Um, so, but the, the removing barriers option would be to just hide the iPad. Right. So he doesn't even think about it. So, um, so now all of a sudden this, you know, you've kind of moved things towards the same outcome, but you haven't introduced this extra tension in the form of the cookie. Um, and so, in this case, in systems, you know, not only is subtracting overlooked, but it, it tends to be the the better option because it removes tension from the system. And that was Lewin, you know, again, that's not my insight, that's Lewin's, but I'm looking at it through a subtraction lens. It makes a ton of sense. Yeah, there's a lot of really good work. I, I love the idea that it removes that tension from, from the system. It, it's, it makes it more efficient in, in reality, particularly when you think about organizations and there, you know, right. you can add that incentive and, and all these other, you know, elements to get more motivation, to get people more motivated. But as you said, that roadblock, that friction is still there. But if you can reduce that, then actually your motivation level either needs to stay the same or goes actually can decrease because it's now easier to do. And so there's lots of, of, of interesting pieces with that. So love that concept as, as you're, as you're talking through this. I wanted to get back to Kate Orff. We mentioned her earlier. What was it that attracted you to that Lexington uh, waterway project? Well, so Kate Orff is a landscape architect who's done some really neat yeah. um civil infrastructure projects, right? I mean, the projects that she's worked on could be considered city planning or even civil engineering. Um, and the thing about all her projects is that she really uses natural systems to meet some of the needs. And what she did in Lexington was um, every other city that grew up along a river, you know, 
buildings grew next to the river and then eventually they put roads next to the river and then eventually the river got covered up which um you sound it sounds like what they covered up a river but i mean there's rivers under new york there's rivers underneath san francisco um it happened in a lot of places so the river got co covered up and then they brought in or if it's like okay how do we revitalize our downtown and like the centerpiece of her plan was kind of removing the infrastructure that was over the over the river and they you know created parks and provided a lot of connectivity throughout the city but also from the city to the surrounding like bluegrass horse farms um and she's done similar projects in the bay area of san francisco also done them in around um after superstorm sandy in the new york area where she's using net like natural resources and removing human built infrastructure to to still meet human needs but meet it in a meet it in a better way so i i was drawn to you know these are just exemplary sustainable development projects but they're also um you know the core design thing that's happening here is she's taking things away one of the other things that you know i like about her work and that's why it kind of gets woven throughout in a couple places in the book is you know not only is she subtracting but she seems to have realized that this um one of the barriers to subtracting is that there's like a negative valence around it right um so that people have this when they think about subtracting it doesn't seem like a, a pleasant idea and that's you know marie kondo realized that it's you know how does this thing spark joy um if it doesn't spark joy get rid of it and so she's you know making subtraction joyful well, Orf does another strategy that I think, you know, we all can learn from, which is basically she just doesn't use the word subtract. So if you look at her plan for Lexington, for example, she's she's got four words that kind of encapsulate what she's doing. And it's um, oh, it's a uh, reveal, clean, carve and connect. Right. Yeah. So where she um, where she you know, removes the infrastructure from the middle of downtown, she calls it reveal because she's revealing the the stream. So whether she's kind of inverted it in her own head um, or whether she's uh, whether she's actually doing this intentionally to um, because she knows that people won't it won't be as appealing to to have something described as reveal um, or to have something described as remove. Um, she she's doing it, and it's you know how is a way she describes her design. And I, I was just reading something this morning on the internet. My neighbor sent me um, from Biden's infrastructure plan, and one of the things that's in there is they're talking about as part of the infrastructure renewal is getting rid of the, some of these highways that are just like devastating cities. And instead of saying subtracting, they're, they're calling it, they're doing the same thing. They're inverting. It's about connectivity or, um, you know, making connections. Um, it's wow. amazing how you frame uh, the, the framing of these elements makes a big difference in how people understand them and, and work with them. I, I wanted to go, you, you talk about scaling uh, this idea, and and within that chapter, you talk about these four components of of, of scaling. And I want to know if you can just talk a little bit about that. You you reference it to this checklist, like emergency doctors uh, use, right? This this element of saying, here's a quick checklist for for people as we're thinking about um, how we do this. And so subtract before improving or triage. Make subtracting first, this Jenga idea, uh, persist to noticeably less uh, Springsteen's darkness. I'm sure Tim is interested in that. And then reuse your subtraction um, and donut holes, which is my favorite um, piece of, of, of all that. Okay, I'm glad you like the donut holes. There's something in there for everybody. Um, <laughs> yes. It's like, uh, so, so yeah, as I was, you know, writing and it was never like, like Tim noticed, it was never intended to be like a kind of spoon fed self-help book but at the same time i wanted to take some of my own advice and say okay well if you have to boil this down to to its essence you know assuming somebody's read the book what would the steps be or how could what were the what would the things be that they should keep in their working memory to, to do better at this and so the first one is like you said kurt the um put uh subtract before improving so so often we kind of come to a problem and don't actually spend time defining what the what the problem is right and so that's the you know it's a little bit meta where you know this is a four-step kind of checklist for subtracting but that's why checklists work you know yeah. you've said okay here's this whole complicated problem and here are the four 
things that matter. Um, and you know, it's not that nothing else matters. It's just that, you know, paying attention to those is going to be a distraction from these four things and, and that's work. And we need to recognize that it's work, but so the first step is to, you know, subtract these extraneous things from the system so that you can wrap your head around it and better understand it and then try to improve it. Then the next step is to subtract first. And that again, goes back to what we found with our research is that part of the problem is we're not even thinking about it. Um, and, you know, our, our default is to think of adding first. So if we just remind ourselves, you know, think of subtracting first, even if that, even if you don't use that subtraction, it's going to be, subtracting is going to be in your brain for the rest of the rest of the problem solving exercise. Um, and then uh, persist, which is really important. Um, so, you know, one of the fundamental challenges subtraction faces is that the results are invisible, right? Um, mm. or, so, you know, it's hard to show competence when you take away a, a paragraph from your report. Nobody knows you ever wrote that thing. Um, but if you if you persist, um, you know, and that's the example of Bruce Springsteen and some of his music, he persisted so much that people are like, whoa, this is different. This is new Bruce Springsteen, like that it's different because it's so stripped down. It's so minimal. And so you can persist in your subtraction to it to make it noticeable. And then uh, the last step is reuse your subtraction. So whereas the the visibility is a fundamental disadvantage to taking away, the the reusing your subtractions is a fundamental advantage to taking away, but we often overlook it. So you know, going back to the Lego example, um, when I added a block to the bridge, there wasn't anything left over from doing that. When Ezra took a block away from the bridge, he had the level bridge, plus he had that block, which he could then use somewhere else. And that's the donut hole, right? It's like it, it took a really long time for people to subtract to make the hole in the donut, which made donuts better because they cooked more evenly and you could put more cinnamon sugar on them or whatever you want. And, uh, and then after you've created that hole, then you can like, you can reuse that hole and you can, you can sell it. Um, so those are the four steps, you know, again, they're not going to help much, you know, you need the context of the book, but that's the point of a checklist, right? You know, you don't, the, the emergency room checklist I talk about in the book, it's, you know, it's not like just because I read that checklist, I can all of a sudden be a medical <laughs> doctor. I mean, you still need the, <laughs> you still need the, you still need the knowledge, but then like the knowledge is best channeled through those steps. Well, and I, I find it fascinating that a, it took a long time to, to take that, the middle part out of the, what was a fried cakes, right? Before they yeah, were yeah. Before taking it out. But then it took a hundred plus years in order for them to people like to actually the companies that make these donuts to actually go, Oh, we could sell these donut holes in the middle, which I love yeah. donut holes, you know? So they, <laughs> <laughs> I know it's, it's. It's so, yeah, it's interesting. It, it is. It is fascinating. And okay. I can tell Tim is wanting to talk about music. Well, you opened it up. I mean, you, you, <laughs> you said you the word there Springsteen. You. And so that does uh, kind of, are you a, just a general fan? Is this? Uh... Yeah. I mean, I, yeah, it's the only music I listen to. So I'm a pretty big fan. <laughs> I mean, I a, it's 75, per, maybe 75 to 80% of the music I listen to. I've been to, Ezra's been to two shows while he was in his, mommy's belly um and so <laughs> and i've been to more than that so yeah mm. definitely a, definitely a fan wow okay so where do you you know uh, tell me about your favorite springsteen uh record song you know what and, what, what and what is it about springsteen that just really engages you when i think of myself as a writer um and certainly not to the caliber that he is but i just really like the way he writes both his the words in his songs, also his autobiography, Born to Run. I mean, that it's it's amazing when you read that because it's like like nothing anybody else has has written. I mean, he's got his his own voice that he's just kind of refined over time. So I just really, I mean, I appreciate that whole like kind of lifelong pursuit of figuring out how to how to share his ideas. Um, and then I, I mean, I like rock and roll, and his music is obviously, or his concerts are just you know, he's just the master at kind of whipping a, an audience into a frenzy, which I, I can't do that, but, um, that's, it's, it's a, <laughs> not, not too it, many people can <laughs> No, but it's, it's amazing to, it's amazing to see. So I think, it, I think probably the thing is like his lifelong kind of dedication to his craft and the fact that he's avoided some of the, seems to have avoided some of the things that happen when you become famous, right. Where you get like less, 
motivated by the the music itself or by the art and you start to you know care about other things and then things taper off so if you had if you had to pick a favorite album and i know that's oftentimes hard right yeah or or maybe a top two or three album where, where would you start well darkness on the edge of town is the one that's in the book um yeah, I would, yeah. it's probably not my f- I don't I guess my favorite might be Born in the USA. I mean that's kind of cliche, but it's like a really wow. good it's a really good album. Um I like the like there's some good songs on there in addition to Born in the USA, but like some of the other. And I also like so I like his newest album I really liked and and, and even the one before that Western so Western Stars was the one before that. That was when yeah. I was kind of doing the the first draft of the book. <laughs> I just listened to that on repeat over and over and over <laughs> until it was like you know that thing where it's like the second song just becomes a continuation of the first song in your brain. Um, and yeah. then, uh, well, uh, the song ghost is just amazing. Um, and I just think his recent one is some of the most like Springsteen stuff that he's put out in a really long time. And I think it's a shame that there's no arena tours that, <laughs> that people, he can... pe- people can be treated to. Yeah. yeah. L- letter it letter would, to you yeah letter to yeah. you yeah. he doesn't yeah. need my my endorsement getting the word out about the springsteen <laughs> albums but um yeah what, what's fascinating to me too about springsteen is a and you mentioned this a little bit in your book is that not only is it his own music but he's written these songs that then other people have gone and taken to be massive hits for the, their own uh element uh and and i again you i, I forget which uh blinded by the lights right which yeah, you know man, you listen yeah, to man. springsteen's version but then you go that's not the version i heard on the on the radio the version i heard was man for man's and, and man for right. man made a living off of you know covering right. yeah. springsteen <laughs> songs song. yeah uh, yeah and i mean he, so springsteen also like he embodies that idea of add and subtract right because you're like springsteen subtracting it's like he's got over he's probably over 400 now but he's definitely in the high 300s of like amazing songs that he's put out there and yet this darkness on the edge of town album um you know he stripped it down to these songs and then the songs are stripped down themselves to very um like kind of sparse words sparse music and it really creates an effect and and then he like in the last 20 years he released a bunch of the outtakes from darkness on the edge of town and there's like 50 songs that he was considering at that time so it's not like it's it's a really good example of you know subtracting isn't like laziness it's not lazy less it's like you have to do all this hard work to get to this point where there's stuff to take away and he really embodied that and i also i mean the the reason i use darkness in the book is as an illustration of this idea of persisting to noticeable less right because if he cut those 50 songs down to a a double album and you know kept in some of the the wordiness that he had in his earlier albums and he, you know, kept in some of the instrumentals, then it, it wouldn't have been such a striking difference from what he'd, what he'd had been doing. And it wouldn't, may not have been noticeable less. So um, by, by persisting with taking away, he made an album that was like, it was sparse, but it was also displayed competence. <laughs> it totally is. Uh, my first uh, introduction to Springsteen was as a sort of this big star, long show, you know, whip the crowd into a frenzy, three hour extravaganza. And I was like, blah, blah, blah. And then, <laughs> then I start reading the lyrics to his songs. He is a songwriter first and foremost. And so you talk about the library that he's created and his lyrics absolutely reflect the kind of economy that, that Shakespeare talks about that you reference on the, on the inside fold, you know, of, of the, the cover, Mm -hmm. you know, with showing how reducing words actually helps us understand things better. Mm -hmm. And, and I've, I've come to know Springsteen over the last 20 plus years, 30 years as, as a guy who is adept at economy at Mm -hmm. really, really carefully selecting his metaphors and very carefully selecting the words that he puts together. I, I think that that is fantastic. So you listen to music while you work, you, you oh, yeah. listen. You, you have to, right? With, with, with lyrics and everything <laughs> pounding, like you're writing well, the book. With, yeah, with, but it's, I mean, it's the, uh, I'm, I'm not listening to new stuff. I'm listening, like, I literally, when I did the first draft, that was, he had just put out Western Stars. So I'm listening to that album over and over and over. So it's not like there's new stuff surprising me. It's just kind of fades into the background and is comforting. And then when I did 
you know, this guy, talk about prolific, right? He puts, I, he puts out two awesome albums in the time it takes me to write one book. And, um, he, <laughs> so then the, the most recent, um, kind of final revisions and there was revisions in between too, but the final revision was the, the most recent album. So I'll listen to music, but it's not new music. I won't try something new out while I'm writing. Well, Lighty, thank you so much for being a guest on Behavioral Groups. We've so appreciated your time. Oh yeah, thanks for having me, and thanks for the the great work you're doing. I've, I've enjoyed listening to the to the other episodes, and look forward to listening to more of them. And, and thank you for um, thanks for so carefully reading the book, and also for letting Ezra come on. That's 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 gonna be the highlight of his. Uh, I am sure his teachers are gonna hear about that on Monday. It's gonna be great. Yeah. <laughs> Welcome to our grooving session where Tim and I groove on what we learned from our conversation with Lighty, have a free flowing discussion and talk about whatever else comes into our subtracted brains. Yeah, man. That was, that was, a, that was a, 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 just a subtracted brain. I mean, we don't have a brain to begin with. So how do you subtract? I mean, is that a <laughs> negative brain? Then how does that work? Yes, yes, that would be that would be as artists say, we're sh- exploring the negative space. Yes, I should have said negative brains because you know, and subtracting from zero, it's negative. So there yeah. you go. Interesting conversation. Yeah, you know? and I think that it's it's a great place to start because we systematically overlook and ignore subtraction. We just it it I mean, in my own life, lots I've I've done really, really well. <laughs> really, really well at adding. I, I have that more ality as, as uh, Lighty likes to talk about it. More ality. Yeah. Yeah. And, and it's, and it's to our detriment, right? It's this idea that we, we overlook those opportunities to remove the Lego and we always want to just add the Lego. And I mean, I loved the, the experiment with the Legos and uh, in the book that he talks about Legos and these uh, uh, was it a, a Star Wars character and they had a model built up kind of like the the bridge one but they they said look you get a dollar if you can solve this by being able to support this brick on top of this so that it is above the the Star Wars character and and it, and it supports it but every every lego that you bring in costs you 10 cents and again the solution the best solution was there was a weak point that had one lego brick but if you remove that lego brick and then put the the top down and did it you would be fine and you would get your dollar but most people added additional legos and either didn't didn't get it to work or it cost them money uh, and they did not get the full dollar. Uh, and so it's, again, we, we systematically overlook that idea of removing something might be the best solution to our, our woes. Back in Predictably Irrational, Dan Ariely even talked about a, a, one of his studies where they were looking about look, looking at relationships. And um, Dan set up this this thing in a lab where you went through doors and er- every door you you got a reward. And certain doors had you know good rewards and certain doors had bad rewards. But people kept those doors open even though there were bad rewards or no rewards associated with them. There's like, I just want to keep that avenue open. I, I can't shut that down. I can't, I don't want to subtract that from my pursuit of there might be something out there. And this is, uh, this doesn't always work to our advantage. I, 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 let's, let's, let's talk about uh, behavioral grooves. Talk about addition. Well, there we go. I mean, what have we added, Tim? We started with a meetup and then and we add the podcast. And then we decide actually what behavioral groups means. <laughs> 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 That's a whole separate conversation. <laughs> separate, and yeah. then, and then we talk, uh, and then, you know, in addition to that, we have added in, uh, we're writing a book, right? Mm-hmm. We've added in uh, the Nudge It North conference as part of, of this that we ended up doing. We, yep. we joined clubhouse. We started weekly groups for a while. We did the special uh, edition for COVID um, you know, adding in this influencers, you know, salon piece and a variety of other factors that we've added in. And that's just some of them. 
And what have we taken away, Tim? Yeah. Weekly grooves. <laughs> one <laughs> thing. One out of all of these. And, and, and we didn't even really take it away. We said, oh, we're just going to integrate it into behavioral <laughs> grooves. And so, yes. you know, it just fell off the wayside. I mean, purposely, it was like, oh, we'll add this in, uh, just add it in as a midweek kind of thing. Yeah. So, yeah, this idea that that removing things just is difficult, but adding things seems to be really easy. And these are just, you know, the projects that we're working on and elements in our in our in our world. It comes in design. It comes in uh, the way that we do things. I think there's a lot of different things where this concept can really be powerful. Well, this is uh, having a good editor on any project that you do makes a big difference. It, it, Lighty does a fabulous job on the inner cover of the book, the the ja inner jacket on the front cover. It's just perfect where he's got these long sentences with, with words and words and words blocked out. And it shows the value of economy, which we talked about a lot. And I, and I love it because that goes back to Shakespeare, who was like the master of economy, like getting really big ideas boiled down to really a small number of words. Uh, but, but this happens in the business world as well. We are more successful when we boil down big ideas into into smaller condensed messages and big problems to reduce them to the, the smallest possible thing. Well, it goes to the paradox of choice and some of those other aspects that we've talked about in the past, but there's, I'm going to go back, back into the nineties. So I'm aging myself Whoa. here, but I was doing, I was doing work with a, a global financial company and they were holding this their their annual meeting and it was in palm springs 3 days 800 participants from all over the globe and what did they do they had these are the leaders of this company all together what, what do you think they did tim i think they boiled down the most strategic issues that they needed to convey and discuss with these leaders and uh, and really thought about what their agenda should be so that they could maximize the impact and retention on the group, right? Yeah, yeah, that's exact. Oh, no, wait. The, what they did <laughs> is they, they basically said, hey, you know, every middle manager in the company felt like you get 15 to 20 minutes to present your what? concept or idea. What? And we're going to be in this blackened ballroom in beautiful Palm Springs for from eight in the morning until four or five, six at night, you know, 15 minute, 15 minute, 15 minute. And what do you think the people that were having this 15 minute in front of 800 people in the leadership, did they boil their concepts down to the one or two key things that they wanted to talk about? No, they just said, here's everything that we're doing on this project. And here's why it's so great. And here's all the people that worked on everything. And so after literally uh, an hour inside people's brains just shut down and it was <laughs> horrid, 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 horrid. That um, is morality in action right there. Yes. It was just more, more, more. And the, 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 what you said though, is this idea that if they would have been strategic and thought about this, like, what are the key things that we have our top leaders here? What do we need them to think about and do? And not only that, but why do we have to fill every moment of the day with activities? We need people to have reflection. They need to be able to mm -hmm. process this information. They need to be able to talk about it in ways where they can meet organically with others. And yet they didn't set that up. I mean, we we had a half day of, actually it wasn't even half day. I think it was two hours of team building on day two. You know, that was, that was my role back then. Yeah. Um, and it was the only thing. It, I will go so far to say that, look, do a lot of work with incentive uh, plans and communicating those incentive plans. And when we get go into an organization, what I see more times than not is that the communication that people are sending about on this is just like, hey, let's put all of the everything that you could ever want to know about these incentive plans in this presentation. And it's the very first thing that we always do is say, like, no, let's let's make sure we chunk this. Let's make sure that we we break this information up so that we're subtracting what people are getting at any one point. And we're highlighting, as you said, here's the key concept. Here's the key 
thing. Don't need to think about all those other the the eligibility rules and the and the regulations and you know what the dosages for this this pill or what the the exact um, quantities and and everything else. No, let's boil it down to the key big pieces of information and let people absorb that and get that and then understand what that means for them and what they need to do with it. And it's this idea of we have to subtract. We have to take a bunch of that information out. It's like that good editor. Let's let's actually talk about Lighty's uh, four steps. To, okay. You know, let, let, let's kind of quickly go through those because I think it's really worth reiterating. We didn't talk about them all that much, but the steps that he suggests is to start with subtract before you start improving. Like do a triage on this. I think this this came from the medical example, right? Yeah. Well, when, and again, to that point that you just, we talked about here, like if I'm putting on this, this massive three-day conference, four-day conference with 800 of my top leaders, I need to subtract. What are the important things that I need these people to walk away with and then subtract everything else and then focus in on what that is, right? Um, it, and, and I think and that- that's what he's talking about there. Absolutely. And that ties into the second one, which is make subtracting first. Yeah. You know, get 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 ahead of get ahead of the, the adding with s- some subtraction. Actually right. get get that get that going before you start adding so that right. you're actually doing a positive thing in the subtraction before you even get started with, with the additional stuff. Yeah. So you've you've identified what those key things are. Now let's make sure that before we try to get there and add to that, that we think about from that key piece that we're trying to work on, let's subtract first. Is there, is there a solution that if we can take something away that will make this work better? Because we know our natural inclination is to add. So we have to use, it's this if-then statement, right? So if we're working on a problem, subtract first, right? Uh, that's this little nomenclature for us to be able to go there. And I love this next one, which is persist until noticeably less. And the the idea of of Bruce Springsteen's darkness, right? Where he said, look, he could have changed just the number of songs that he put on there and people, he would have subtracted, but people wouldn't have noticed. He could have, you know, changed up the musical way that he, he made that album a little bit. And again, people wouldn't have noticed. Uh, and I think that was really cool. And I, I want to let's get to the fourth one, but then I want to come back to that because I think there's a key concept on just noticeable difference there. Yeah, and the and the fourth one is to reuse your subtraction. So the things that you take out, find a way to reutilize that, repurpose. Give it doesn't you know like kind of like weekly grooves. We took weekly grooves out as a separate product or as a separate band in in the the podcast world but um but we've sort of repurposed something that we took out to make sure because we still like the idea and we just integrated it into behavior grooves in a positive way yeah yeah and it's donut holes oh my god donut holes. Right? <laughs> okay so what did you want to you kind of teed up this idea you want to talk about springsteen's darkness on the edge of town it it brought to mind this concept of just noticeable difference right j and d which is this idea that, hey, if I lift up a, a one pound weight and a two pound weight, I can definitely tell that that two pound weight is more than the one pound weight. It's a mm-hmm. one pound difference, but I can, I can definitely tell. If I lift a 25 pound weight and a 26 pound weight, it's much harder for me and for most people to be able to discern which one, if it's not labeled on there, I can't tell which one is heavier. It's not a big enough difference relative to its overall weight, even though it's still one pound difference. So it's a, there's a one pound difference between the one and two, and there's a one pound difference between the 25 and 26, but I can't tell when it's masked with that larger piece. And so this idea I, that I was just going is, all right, so noticeably less, right? He said where this, I persist until noticeably less. And I was just wondering from Springsteen's perspective that, you know, darkness came out relatively early in his career. And yeah. so he had less of a body of work. And I'm wondering if if he would have done darkness now, if if that difference would have been noticed, because he would have done different things through, you know, born in the USA sounded different than others and and all of the different sounds. So all of a sudden that that body of works get, gets bigger, but also you know, what is noticeably different 
needs to change. And so I think it might have to be much more drastic. And I think that's an interesting piece to think about if we're thinking about persisting until noticeably less. I think that's a really cool observation, Kurt. I really like the timing aspect of it and where it falls in the the arc of his body of work, I think really is important. And in the way that we process things, we, b- before we started recording, we were talking with Mary about like the difference between zero and a hundred deaths from the pandemic versus 149,900 deaths and 150,000 deaths. It's still a hundred, but the impact that it has on us when it's the zero to 100, those hundred deaths mean a lot more to us uh, than the, the difference between 149,900 and 150,000. Those are, that's, that doesn't impact us the same way. And, and I, I think it kind of goes back to Kahneman and Tversky's we're kind of present we're, 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 when we're presented with information that we're percentage wise, but absolute foolish. We do, a, we, <laughs> yeah. do, we do a pretty good job of detecting big differences in percentages, but when the percentages get really small, then we tend to not pay as much attention to them. And, and so getting back to Lighty's thing, Getting to a just noticeable difference is a really big deal, actually, when it comes to how we're going to process that and and in our in our minds, how our minds are going to actually understand something. I, I think the JND is a big, big concept to take away from this. You know, the other thing about numbers and stuff like that too is we're not good at understanding big numbers. You know, the 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 difference between a million and a billion. We don't necessarily understand that very well. It's huge. Billion it's, to a trillion. It's huge. Yeah. And we don't understand those. those Just more zeros. Which is yeah. a whole aside. There you go. All right. Um, can we talk about Kurt Lewin? Really? Why would you want to talk about Kurt Lewin? You never know. want to talk about him. He has a cool name. He went to the university or he taught at the University of Iowa. It was, you know, all this cool stuff. So He is one of your heroes. And for good reason. Yeah, he's always. he's good and and actually it's it's interesting but I love that that Lighty brought him in that this idea that uh bringing in the force field analysis right that there are you know Kurt Lewin talked about force fields uh is a term he used that that brought in this idea that there's restricting forces and there's driving forces and so in any way that our behavior is shaped uh you can increase the driving forces to overcome those restricting forces or you can reduce the restricting forces and then the driving forces will will move it forward in, in that direction. And this idea that removing barriers, this subtracting piece is actually allowing you to move forward is a really key concept that I thought Lighty brought up. And I love the idea that that by removing barriers, you're also reducing tension in that in that equation. Yeah. Yeah. That's that's the magic for me is is when Lighty introduced the idea that, that Lewin's suggestion of in, in reducing, which we talk about today, is sort of like reducing friction. Roger Dooley yep. does a great job of of using the word friction as a way to reduce friction can uh, help change behaviors in a really positive way. But but when Lighty brought up Lewin's idea that removing barriers is tantamount to reducing tension in the system, like wow, that just that just kind of blew my mind open to think about what are the things we could do in these highly politicized, highly polarized times to reduce tension might be taking some things off the table, might be actually mm-hmm. taking some of the the issues that we're fighting over to say, let's not fight about that stuff. Let's, yeah. let's actually pull that off the table. And I think he brought up a really good example with Ezra, right? This idea of trying not to have Ezra not use his iPad after dinner. Uh, there's tension <laughs> yeah, right. if he tries to add incentives or different pieces, because then you get this, is the incentive enough? I have to weigh that in. And then there's tension in Ezra. There's the, you know all of that piece that comes into it. If Ezra doesn't see the iPad and doesn't have that, that prompt to use it, then there's no need to have an incentive in place. And there's no tension because Ezra's we're focusing in on other pieces. And I think I, I see that with my kids. I see it with me. I see it with a variety of different factors. So, so anyway, Lewin is just amazing. 
Absolutely. We, we, we need to. It, we, we need to think about how we can apply this in the real world because this is an underutilized concept, I think. And yeah. I know you were really impressed with this idea that, hey, his ideas go beyond just self-help and are looking at a larger societal piece, this tipping point for the world. I was just really impressed by that. I was not expecting that. Let me just put it that way. When, when I read Lydie's book, I wasn't anticipating this researcher uh, who comes to behavioral science through engineering to be so focused on climate change, for instance, mm-hmm. and and the environmental uh, aspects of the you know of life. And so I I love when he talked about the planetary tipping point. That was like wow. We have a we have the same water on the planet as we've had for the last, you know, since the Earth was created. We don't have any new sources of H two O. It's it's a, it's a closed system, right? So there's only so much. Now technology will certainly help, but I think that it's hubris to think that technology is going to work our way through all of the the problems of scarcity that we have while we are increasing our population and coupled with this morality, you know, just more, 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 more is, is not working to our advantage. And that was a big aha for me in a really good way. Yeah. We have one planet and we're not going to, at least in the near future, there's not a way to get another planet. We can't add another planet. (laughs) (laughs) And so if we, there are no more planets right now. (laughs) Right. And we don't necessarily want to subtract this planet because that wouldn't work. And we, and we we're doing that slowly through all of these factors of we're trying to, as you said, morality within, within the world and it's slowly killing the planet and, and us as well on it. And so I think that's a really big piece. And I, it, to your point, it was surprising um, that this was talked about as part of this book and it was really great. So did that, did that catch you off guard when, when, yeah, you know, it did. And, and just the, the, again, in the book, and we didn't talk about this, but in the book, he, brings up uh, like the the three big things that he talks about at the at the beginning are like this removal of the of the bri- or the the highway in San Francisco is the Embarcadero I, I I always pronounce that wrong Embarcadero um, Embarcadero there there was a you know the freeway there and there was they built it and then every there was a bunch of people that wanted to take it away but it you know there wasn't it and it wasn't until the big earthquake that it fell and then they were able to remove it and even then there was a fight to subtract that and then there was this idea also of you know subtracting this financial elements for uh South Africa apartheid and the this role that people who had said look we're just not going to take these um, shipments from South Africa out of the ship. And it was these union workers on the docks that made the, that started this, that got everybody to subtract investments in South Africa, which again was a huge societal change. So he's looking at some big picture pieces here. And that was, that was not where I thought it was going to go. I thought it was going to be more of this research based and different pieces, but the stories he wove in were much broader in impact and scale than I had anticipated. And I thought that was cool. Yeah. Agreed. Loved it. All right. Well, people hang on because Tim is going to come back and give you a bonus track. You don't want to miss. We're giving you more, (laughs) more, more, more. (laughs) But if we could figure out a way of subtracting it, we would. This is Tim with the bonus track and groove idea for the week. We tend to add things to our lives much more than we remove things. And this is a core aspect of being human. We've been builders of things since the dawn of civilization. It's also something that can hold us back from making significant improvements in our lives, from seeking new paths to happiness and from finding new ways to innovate. The idea of subtraction is not new. Lydie traces it to Lao Chu from the 6th century before Common Era, through Da Vinci, through Kurt Lewin, and right up to today's literature with Marie Kondo and Tim Ferriss. But Mighty's thoughts are truly fresh because he's adding to this historical narrative scientific data. And great thinkers have already noted that we can find more happiness with less, but Lighty's work is offering new ways to think about this uphill battle with our natural desires. We discuss Lighty's view of the planetary tipping point, 
where our very fixed resource planet gets maxed out by humans with an unlimited desire for more. And this is especially important in the conversation about climate change, and he's concerned that hubris around technological progress will crowd out simple acts of subtraction that could have outsized effects like simply consuming less. We were also happy to talk about one of Kurt's heroes, Kurt Lewin, and his force field analysis. Lighty's observation that not only does Lewin claim that removing barriers, which popular writers like Roger Dooley have identified as friction, can be meaningful interventions, but he goes further to note that removing barriers also reduces tension in a system, and that's a cool idea. Okay, here's your groove idea for the week. Take a hard look at your life, your surroundings, your habits, your activities. What is the one thing that you could get rid of? One thing that you could subtract from your life that will make it better. Identify it, then do it, and then let us know what happens. We also want you to think about what is the one thing that we here at Behavioral Grooves could get rid of? Is there something that we could actually cut from the show that would make it better? Uh, Note, I've actually tried to subtract Kurt, but he keeps sticking around. So I don't know what we're going to do about that. But send us your ideas. We would love to hear from you. And with that, we want to thank you for listening. We do appreciate the time you spend with us, and we hope that it is valuable. And if it is, please leave us a review or share this podcast episode with a friend. And with that, we encourage you to go out this week and find your groove.